Welcome back to Modern Tactical Shooting. Now this video is part one of a two-part series on the history of Special Forces body armor and tactical gear that we used in combat at the very beginning of the War on Terror and up to basically when I retired in 2017. So in this part one, I'm going to be covering the body armor, chest racks, and tactical gear that we used in the early days of Iraq uh, up until about the middle of the 2000s. So let's go. Now, before I go right into what we used during the invasion of Afghanistan and the invasion of Iraq, let me set the stage a little bit. Now, prior to 2000, body armor with hard plates was not a normal thing that we used in training. In fact, when I showed up in 5th Special Forces Group in 1998, we only had 12 sets of body armor in the company, and you would sign out the body armor only when you did CQB training, after your CQB training, you would turn that body armor back in. Well, you fully expected that if we were called to go back to war, it would be like Desert Storm, and generally, we would not be wearing body armor. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the infantry prior to Special Forces. I wore the Ranger-style body armor one time, and that was in 1995 when I was in the first of the 508th out of Vincenza, Italy. We were sent to help protect the embassy in Liberia. It was the second time that we had to protect the embassy. The first time the Marines did it in 1994, and we, we rolled up in 95, and we had the Ranger body armor. But that was the one and only time I saw body armor with hard plates prior to 2000 with the adoption of the spear bulk system, which uh, the majority of this video is gonna focus on and I'm going to get into right now. So the spear bulk system, we got it in 2000. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it was body armor, a pack system, and a load bearing system, basically an LCE slash type vest that we were issued. I was actually part of the final test committee. Now the Rangers actually showed up for the testing of the spear bulk system also, but they had already adopted the Ranger rack system around 1998, 1999. They were the first ones to get Molly pouches. And honestly, they showed up for one day of the trials, looked at it and they were like, we'll keep the Ranger rack. But as I said in previous videos, I did not uh, take part in the invasion of Afghanistan. I took part in the invasion of Iraq in 2003, but the gear special forces guys used in the invasion of Afghanistan and the subsequent uh, year just before the invasion of Iraq. Basically, guys wore the same gear, the spear vest, uh, the rucksack, and the uh, pouches and assault vests that I'm going to be going to show you in these clips right here. So let's get into it. So again, up until 2000, we didn't have molly gear. We didn't have the spear system. We ran normal LCEs. I uh, used the same Alice gear LCE I used during my seven years in the infantry. I went into special forces using that. Now in 2000, we got the spear bulk system. And one of the major flaws or issues I had with the spear system, and a lot of SF guys did, is the vertical molly webbing on the front. The Navy SEALs were adamant about having their vertical molly webbing. They wanted to be able to run their mag pouches horizontally. The problem with that is those mag pouches, they were closed by snaps and they were a double magazine holder. So if you ran your mag pouches horizontally, you take the mag out, your second mag, if you didn't snap it back up, there was nothing keeping that mag from falling out. So a system didn't really make sense. And you could only wear three mags on the, on the front and that was it. There was no room for any other gear. We weren't happy with that setup at all. We wanted horizontal molly webbing. That way we could load up the front of the vest. But it did not happen. And that led to, you know, guys running their own uh, kit over the spear body armor. Again, you saw that in Afghanistan. Going back to that movie, 12 Strong. A great example of guys running their own vests over the spear body armor because it didn't have the correct molly webbing on the front. So another big problem with the spear issued gear, the LCE, that load bearing system that came with it was super cheaply made. None of these straps and buckles would stay tight. You'd have to tape them down or literally tie the waist strap down uh, past the buckles to keep everything tight. Under a full combat load, everything would just come loose and the whole vest would start sagging. So not very well made. And that's another reason why you don't see a lot of SF guys in old photos running the issued spear stuff, you'll see them running aftermarket uh, vests and gear made by companies like Blackhawk and Eagle Industries. 
And with the culture of the time, again, looking back at old photos, you'll notice some SF guys in Afghanistan and during the invasion of Iraq in 2003 did not wear body armor at all. They just wore chest racks or harnesses. One guy I served with, J.D. Morris, he didn't wear body armor during the invasion of Iraq. He actually hung his body armor on the door of the Humvee. Our Humvees or our GMVs, they had zero armor uh, going into the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Some guys ran doors. I didn't run a door because the door wouldn't stop anything anyways. And we were always thinking offensively. So if we got shot at, we wanted to be able to jump out of the Humvee fast and be able to engage the enemy. But the guys who did run doors on their Humvees, a lot of them just hung the spear body armor over their door. That way they would have some protection. Another problem with the spear body armor vest, the hook loop pile tape uh, Velcro, basically, that kept the shoulders in place was, again, not the best material. Velcro is a trademarked item. It was not Velcro, it was a copy of it, hook loop pile tape, it was very cheap. And you had to tape your shoulders down or the body armor would separate under weight or getting dragged or jumping around through buildings and stuff. Your body armor could literally just fall apart at the shoulders. So you'll see in a lot of the photos, there's tape around everybody's shoulders and that's to keep the spear vest from basically coming in half while you wear it. So Afghanistan and 2003 Iraq, the most popular brands of chest racks and LCEs that guys wore were, of course, Blackhawk was big at the time, Eagle Industries, there was some Tactical Tailor also. Those are the major brands I can think of off the top of the head, my head that were the go-to brands that guys wore. I myself, I went into the 2003 invasion with the Eagle Industries. It was actually a prototype Molly vest at the time. They actually gave me to wear, and I loaded it up uh, as if I was going on patrolling. I had canteens on there. I had GP pouches. I had mag pouches. I remember I had that vest loaded up as much as I could. But once we got on the ground in Baghdad, it was actually a lot of stuff that I didn't need. And I ended up using a chest rack, a Blackhawk chest rack, loaned to me by J.D. Morris. Uh, he brought multiple sets of gear with him. He was a more senior guy than S in SF than I was at the time. We weren't on the same ODA, but uh, him being a senior, more experienced SF guy, he's one of the guys I looked up to during my time in 5th Special Forces Group. Smart guy, uh, knew a lot about guns, knew a lot about gear, hence he brought multiple systems with him. I ended up running a Blackhawk chest rig that he lent me. I actually have not the same one. Uh, this is a newer one, but the same version. Of course, I wore an OD green one in 2003. This is a later version. It's the exact same thing. Uh, this is the tan model. You can actually find these super cheap on eBay, but this is basically the same one I wore during the invasion of Iraq. And I remember the way I had it rigged is I had three pouches rigged up with two mags each, and then the fourth pouch I kept, that's where I kept my radio. Of course, it has a space for two pistol mags. We had IFACs at the time, but tourniquets were not an issued item until 2004. And during the invasion, I just kept dressings and IFAC items in my pockets. And again, tourniquets did not become standard issue to a year later in 2004. So going into the invasion of Iraq in 2003, we didn't have tourniquets. We actually had a thing called the Fibrogen dressing. It was made out of real blood platelets from donors. And I remember we had to sign a waiver and only special forces had these uh, special dressings, basically a precursor to quick clot dressings. Also, you'll notice in the photos, most of the guys are wearing black, uh, black hawk duty belts and drop leg holsters. Those were the standard for that era, that two inch wide black hawk duty belt. And before we got these Safariland 6004 drop leg holsters, we used Black Hawk Nylon and Eagle Industries drop leg holsters with the thumb snap button that wouldn't secure your pistol properly in place. Around 2004, Safariland, that 6004 holster really hit the scene, and that is a game changer, and that's which... That's the holster we judge all holsters off of. And of course, during that time period, drop leg holsters were the way to go. Now, this picture here, this is from the push into Baghdad, again, the 2003 invasion. You notice the giant rucksack on the back of the Humvee. That's the Spearbulk's rucksack. It was not popular at all. 
Might have been a great mountaineering backpack if you're gonna climb up Everest, but to wear with combat gear, it was just too big, and actually the shoulder straps were way too thin. You could cram a ton of stuff in there, but it was not practical to carry it all. That's why it's strapped to the outside of the Humvee, just to hold all my stuff. My actual fighting loadout, I kept in a smaller pack behind my seat. Uh, I don't remember the exact brand. I am going to do a separate video on assault packs and three-day packs that we used in Special Forces. So that will be something to keep an eye out later on. Now, going into 2004, which was my second Iraq tour, if you notice, I now have pouches attached directly to my spear body armor. We did not get issued new spear body armor with the horizontal molly webbing. Uh, we actually, team members took it upon themselves or within the unit to have tubular nylon, one inch tubular nylon, sewn horizontally so we could wear our pouches like a normal modern assault vest. And actually, my team sergeant, uh, he knew how to sew and he actually sewed all the spear body armor for the guys on my team. And you'll see in these pictures, you'll see the green tubular nylon sticking out. Now this photo right here, this is from 2004 at Darcy, the Direct Action Resource Center in Little Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas, just before I had my spear vest modified with the molly webbing or the tubular nylon horizontally, I was wearing that chest rack. I don't remember the manufacturer who made it, but I actually still have it. And that's this chest rack here. It was a super, or it is a super simple chest rack. Uh, it holds six mags and has molly webbing horizontally. So my plan was to, you know, carry my basic loadout on six mags and then molly all the other pouches I needed to the front of this uh, chest rack. But I ended up getting my vest modified. This gentleman standing right next to me, very fine infantryman. This is Specialist Keith Fiscus. Unfortunately, a year later in 2005, he was killed in action. Uh, I just want to say he was a great infantryman attached to our team back in 2004. They were from the 25th Infantry Division. I remember we had a squad of soldiers attached to us, and that's normal in Special Forces. We call them an uplift. You'll get a squad or a platoon of infantry to supplement your ground force power. So I just like to, whenever I show a picture of myself and Fiscus, I just like to mention him and his ultimate sacrifice that he gave to this country. Now, you may have noticed... In all the photos I've shown so far, there are no open top magazine pouches. What I mean by open top, I mentioned getting this style in 2004. So it has the open top with the bungee retainers. Uh, we didn't, that really wasn't the norm going up into the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Most pouches had the flap pouches like this vest here. Uh, in 2004, we started to see the open top pouches. Now this gentleman right here, this is Travis Rolf of 1st Battalion, 5th Special Forces Group, Warrant Officer at the time. He was actually one of my instructors when I went through Robin Sage, and I just so happened to be uh, assigned to the same company as him in Special Forces. Now here he is serving as a member of the SIF or the CRIF. That's the Commander's Interdiction Force, Commander's Response Force is what they changed it to. Now he's wearing paraclete body armor here, and I just spoke to him about this setup and some of his own custom pouches, but as you notice, in these photos, he has open top magazine pouches. Now, Travis would actually go on to uh, create Mayflower, that great gear company, and take over Mayflower and Velocity Systems. So basically, he used his expertise of his time in Special Forces to fill the gap in gear that he knew SF guys uh, were lacking uh, based on his combat experience. He was one of those guys, again, another gentleman I always looked up to when I first got to Special Forces because he was into guns and gear, very switched on individual. Now this picture here, if you notice this rifle, this is a pretty famous rifle. There's some pictures of this, of this setup going around the internet. He basically took a Mark 12 SPR. It's cut down slightly and he ran it CQB style. Again, very experienced SF soldier. Now runs Mayflower uh, and uh, if you're interested in you know high quality gear, of course, I'm an ATS brand ambassador, but Mayflower is another company, Velocity Systems, to look at. Now, going into 2005, we finally got rid of the spear body armor. It had a very short service life due to its deficiencies. We adopted it in 2000, and by early 2005, uh, SOCOM, Special Forces Command, adopted the Eagle Industries Cirrus Maritime body armor. Now, at this time, we still did not run side hard armor. We would not see issued side hard armor until a few years later when we adopted the 
uh, Eagle and Bab, but I'll get into that into part two. But by 2005, we had the uh, Eagle Cirrus Maritime body armor, pretty good body armor carrier, full, full soft armor, uh, wraparound soft armor. Uh, now we kept the spear pouches, so you'll notice that in some of these photos, I'm running old DCU pouches, but at least we had better body armor. Before I get into 2005 Iraq, let me backtrack a little bit. You may have noticed in some of the photos I'm wearing baseball hats. The reason why we wore baseball hats is not just to be cool guys because we're special forces. There was actually a reason why we went to baseball hats during the 2003 invasion into Baghdad. Sometimes we wore helmets in 2003, but once we hit Baghdad, I literally remember my company Sergeant Major saying, all right, time to put on the baseball hats. And it wasn't just because we're special forces, we want to look cool. There was actually a pretty good reason why we went to baseball hats. This is the actual hat I wore at the time, a Blackwater hat. There wasn't much insurgent activity uh, at, right after the fall of Iraq in 2003. The enemy activity really was looters, rioters, and if you were going to get shot at, it was usually targets of opportunity when you're driving down the road, guys just taking pop shots for the hell of it, not really directed insurgent activity. So we went to baseball hats as one, as a far recognition signal. In Baghdad, there were thousands of U.S. soldiers, and you'd be out and about. And if we wore baseball hats uh, and you were working in crowds of people, it was easy to tell other SF guys apart from the regular soldiers that were out there. If you go back in time and look at old photos of the fall of Baghdad, there were civilians, thousands of civilians out in the streets. The thousands of soldiers doing their separate missions. So we wore baseball hats for a far recognition signal. Also, and I did this a lot, uh, when we did have that crime uh, activity and guys taking pop shots at us, we started to spread the word that, you know, the guys with the baseball hats were not the regular army. So if you take pop shots at us, we're not just going to drive by and hope we didn't get hit. We're going to stop, get out, we're going to chase you down and kill you. And after the first week in Baghdad, after Baghdad fell, word spread pretty quickly that the guys in baseball hats were different and you didn't want to mess with them. So there's actually a psychological uh, effort with wearing the baseball hats that uh, the people learned real quick that guys in baseball hats were different. You didn't want to mess with them. And that actually carried over into 2004. My second deployment, we stopped wearing baseball hats. We were wearing helmets by then. IEDs had started to pick up a little bit. But uh, I was working up in Huija, and when the, again, this is when we were driving with no doors on. We had guns all over the trucks. We would drive through the city. We wouldn't get hit with any IEDs. A regular arm, arm, army convoy would drive by right after us on that same route 20 minutes later, and they would get IED'd. So the word was still out that these guys in these special uh, GMVs with the guns all over them, 240s out the doors, 249s out the back, you didn't want to mess with them. So that we had a psychological impact uh, the first year or two in Iraq uh, with, hey, these guys are special. So that can work for and against you uh, if when you do look different. Sometimes we would deliberately dress like the regular army, helmets, try and match uniforms to blend in so we would look like regular army, regular army soldiers. And sometimes it was advantageous to really look different. Uh, to let the enemy know, hey, uh, we are different and we're going to do things differently, more violently and aggressively, more often than not. Now, speaking of IEDs, uh, during the invasion, we didn't see IEDs. Uh, my 2004 trip, my second tour, we really didn't see IEDs. They did start in probably late 2004. Across Iraq, uh, the IED threat started to pick up. We still had no armor on our GMVs at the time, but really it was 2005 when the IED threat really started to become super aggressive. Uh, good example is my ODA. We never got hit with an IED my first or second tour. It was my third tour in 2005. We were IED five different times. Uh, I was actually driving and got IED. It was perfect timing. They kicked it off right as I was driving by driver's side door. Luckily for me, I think the IED was buried too deep. During that time, 2005, 90% of your IEDs were actually buried artillery rounds. You could tell it's an artillery round because when the shrapnel blows up, it blows up inside out and there's a circular pattern to the shrapnel. I actually still have a piece of the IED that kicked off on me. My Humvee was peppered with these uh, artillery shell pieces. Luckily for me, by 2005, we started to add armor to our Humvees. 
We had armored doors, ballistic windshields, armored side panels. We didn't have any bottom armor, but at least we had side armor. And that's probably what saved me from getting uh, wounded or perhaps killed. Uh, and I think that IED was just buried a little bit too deep, luckily for me. So great timing. They kicked it off right on my door, but uh, they buried it too deep. One thing I have not mentioned yet is plate carriers. I didn't really see commercially available plate carriers till 2004, my second tour in Iraq. And the only time I wore a plate carrier, and they were very rudimentary at the time, I had a Black Hawk plate carrier, we had a few issued to the team, is I wore a plate carrier when we were basically patrolling out in the countryside off-road where there wasn't a high IED threat. During uh, missions, we're driving the roads, most guys wore the full vests, and the direct action missions when we're doing hits on houses and compounds, we tried to armor up as best we could. And most guys will wear the full Cirrus vests with the, uh, you know, soft armor and hard plates. So rudimentary plate carriers did exist. And of course, now they're all the rage, but I'll talk more about plate carriers in part two. Now you may have noticed this DCU top that was hanging behind me. Of course, most combat elements, when they went to the Middle East, they were issued DCUs, but DCUs were, was actually the issued uniform for 5th Special Forces Group even prior to 9-11. This was our duty uniform, meaning when we were in garrison, we wore BDUs, but anytime we did any training, we wore DCUs because it was a unit issue item, and if you tore them up, you could replace them and not have to use your meager clothing allowance to buy new uniforms. So it was kind of a mark of distinction that when we were out training, especially with other special forces groups, they all knew, hey, here comes the fifth group guys because this was our duty uniform. We wore DCUs, even stateside. If you noticed in a lot of the pictures from Blackwater, Darcy, we're wearing DCUs. Also, the unit provided Arabic name tapes and they would modify our uniforms to put the waist pockets up on the sleeves so we could have pockets up on the sleeves, which was handy to put in IFAX and uh, medical items to have them um, handy instead of digging around in your kit. That's what I generally use the arm pockets for, was for IFAC items. But uh, I still have one uniform top. So yeah, cool piece of history. So there it is. That is the complete history of kit and body armor in the early years of Iraq. And again, a lot of the same vests and body armor were being used in Afghanistan at the time. Now, stay tuned for part two, where I'm going to pick up and cover the kit and body armor that we used uh, during my time in Afghanistan. Again, I did three tours in Afghanistan starting in 2012, so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to make a future video about the different rucksacks and packs that we used within Special Forces. But as always, hopefully you found this video informative and entertaining. And as always, I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.